All right, welcome back to the podcast. It's uh, it's going to be a little different this week than uh, than what our listeners are accustomed to. Um, it's been a rough week for, for everybody, and um, Tim and I decided that we were going to do something a little bit different. We're not going to talk about DVDs and Blu-rays today. Uh, between the uh, the George Floyd protests and the riots and the pandemic and uh, the earthquake we have out here and yeah. and, kill, and, and all we needed was a tsunami and <laughs> murder murder hornets and monkeys stealing uh, vaccines and virus vials. It's uh, 2020 is turning out to be quite the thing. So, uh, given what went on uh, this last week in so many cities uh, around the country in the aftermath of uh, of uh, the George Floyd killing in Minneapolis, we wanted to kind of use the prism of movies and our own experience in the past to sort of try to give everybody a little bit of perspective and hope. Uh, It's easy to get lost in the moment. It's easy to get caught up in what's going to happen tomorrow and the next day and sort of lose track of next year and the year after and two and three and four years from now. And our obvious frame of reference is is 1992, the L.A. riots, when... uh, Tim and I were both working for Entertainment Today mm. and uh, had rather fascinatingly divergent experiences on that. Tim, I'll let you uh, kind of jump into 92 and your recollections of that because your story is very interesting. Well, yeah, ni- ni- so 1992, yeah, yeah, I had only been here, uh, yeah, Bridget and I, my wife and I, uh, arrived in 1990. So we arrived in, in Los Angeles 30 years ago, uh, uh, you know, this year. Um, uh, and, and so 1992, uh, you had been working at that magazine with you for a couple of years. Uh, the, the events, the events, uh, uh, the Rodney King beating, uh, and then uh, the trial and all of that. So Rodney King, that was March of 91. Uh, and the actual events of 1992, the day the riots began, we're talking April 29, 1992. On April 29th, 1992, I was on the rooftop apartment building with the noted character, late noted character actor, Vincent Chiavelli. Uh, Vincent Chiavelli was wonderful. Uh, For years, he was on that that show Moonlighting uh, with Bruce Willis and uh, Sybil Shepard. And that particular year, he was in Batman Returns. He had a sort of major character role in Batman Returns. And and I was on his rooftop interviewing him the afternoon of April 29th, 1992. And I remember... I remember sitting there in the, in the sun, and we were chit-chatting, and, and I had a tape recorder with a cassette in it. Remember those? What? Yeah, oh, do I ever. <laughs> I, remember, I remember swapping my tapes out in the middle of, uh, of junkets. It's like, oh, my, the end of a side. I'm going to miss something. You pull it out, and you flip it around. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I said that. Okay. And I looked out over the horizon because we were in, I guess it's West Hollywood. We were in the Fauntleroy. He lived yeah. in the Fauntleroy uh, building, very sort of you know, fancy building there up on that hill. And you could see all the way towards South Los Angeles. You could see downtown, uh, past uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, the uh, what is it, the Parker Center, uh, yeah. the City Hall, and all of that, all the way downtown. And I looked towards South Los Angeles, and I saw this fire burning. I was like, "Oh wow! Look over there! Look like something's on fire!" And Vincent looked over that way. He says, "Oh yeah, it's a pretty good sized fire." And I looked to to the, <laughs> to the south of him. I said, "Well, look over there. There's, it looks like something on fire over there too." He says, "Yeah." And, oh, look over there. It looks like something's on fire. So we saw these four gigantic fires burning in South. We went into his apartment, turned on the television, and got acquainted with the riots that had uh, started, uh, gotten underway. And, man, I got to tell you, it was like running a gauntlet to get from his apartment back to our house, our apartment in uh, West. Well, we were living in Westwood at the time. Uh, and the police were out in force. So 1992, 2020, you know, these things are so, so, so similar and so much built around all the same stuff. So we have, we're going to have some documentaries we're going to talk about in a second. But Wade, yeah. uh, you pick it up from there and tell the folks uh, what you were dealing with in well, 1992. Well, as it happens, uh, I was also on my way to do something for entertainment today, but I was on the other side of the planet. Uh, I had been uh, uh, work. I wanted to go to the Cannes Film Festival for the first time in my life, you know, out of film school in 1990. Uh, met you literally, you know, that I, I, we both started working for Entertainment Today that, that, that year that you had gotten out here. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was fresh out of school. You were, you were fresh in town. And um, so I, I had been working for a couple of years part-time during the summers for Air France. 
So I would go to Entertainment Today during the day. I was working in the office. I took the job that you smartly had turned down <laughs> and uh, suffered for it. And I'd sit there and I'd, you know, do editing and typing and work my butt off and write stuff. Uh, and then at 5 o'clock, I'd run and I'd put on my Air France uniform, hop in my car, and zip the 20-some-odd miles out to LAX from Burbank and, uh, you know, get there in time to start my, uh, hopefully get there in, in time to start my 6.30 shift for, uh, for Air France. And I'd work until 11 o'clock that night, just dead to the world. And I did that so that I'd be able to get a ticket to the Cannes Film Festival that year. And, uh, you know, $120 round trip ticket, stayed with people that I knew. I was able to do that whole festival rather inexpensively. And that was going to be the highlight of my year. And uh, I, I decided, you know, that started on the 7th of May in uh, 1992, which was a Thursday, and you and I planned on getting to Cannes, kind of hanging out on the 4th, and then for a few days before that, I was going to hang in Paris with uh, an old friend of the family's, lovely f f woman that my father had met many, many years earlier, who, uh, who uh, you know, was a widow and was going to let me stay with her, and it was, you know, I, I was going to stay with her for a little while. So I'd been there for a couple of days, I'd gotten to Paris, I think, on the 27th, and on the 29th, I'd just been floating around eating croissants and, you know, checking out the sights and walking up and down the Champs-Élysées. And I got back to her place for dinner. And she says, oh, things are happening back at your place. Oh, and, oh. And, and I said, did my mother call? Is everything okay? And she says, oh, no, 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 no. It's not your mother. It's, you know, your, L.A., your place, L.A. I was like, L.A.? Like Rodney King and the truck. That was out of my mind. I was on can. That's where my head was. My head was in France and Cannes and movies, and I was all excited about the movies I was going to see. And uh, we flipped the TV on, and there it was. And there, there I am in Paris watching on television places that I know, uh, places that I've, I've driven, you know, uh, Crenshaw Boulevard. There it is. I've, 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 you know, I've been to... All up and down Crenshaw, um, uh, La Cienega, been up and down La Siena, Normandy. I've been up and down Normandy. I know these places. And, um, and there it is. It's on, it's on fire. And it was a surreal experience being so separated from it and yet so connected to it at the same time. It made the world so small. Mm. It made it so, so small. And, um, cause you had been very young doing these, what is it, the, the 65? Was it 65? Well, sixty-five. I, I was a I was a baby, <laughs> but yeah. But it was sixty-eight. It was sixty-eight. Yeah, sixty-eight. Okay. It was sixty-eight that I that I have a vague recollection of because sixty-eight and sixty-nine were really volatile years, you know. Mm. Uh, I, it, but I have vague recollections of certain things uh, of the Kennedy, you know, Bobby Kennedy assassination, Martin Luther King's assassination, the riots, uh, man landing on the moon, Vietnam, and Dan Rather reporting. Uh, all of these things I ha I do have a strong recollection of. Mm. And, um, and, and so there was a bit of a, a childhood flashback to that. Um, you know, I remember the Manson killings. I remember us getting double locks on every door in the house because, yeah. you know, there are, there are crazy hippies out there who will come and, and kill you. And, and think about that. Those Manson killings were, uh, it, it, you know, you know that that those events happened in you, know, I, I, you wouldn't exactly call them the suburbs, but it was we're we're well north and west of the ten. Yes, the freeway, uh, yes. The Manson killings. It, it was, uh, and you know, the Hillside Strangler wasn't that long after that. So oh, I yeah. mean, those were those were volatile times, and um, uh, more volatile than now, by the way. That's kind of the point that I think People I... forget about the Sindhianese uh, Liberation, Liberation Army. Army. The Weathermen. Uh, the, 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 the Weathermen. People forget yeah. about all of that stuff. Dude, these, yeah. these, these, were, these were organizations of our youth. These were anarchist yeah. organizations. We talk about anarchist organizations now. Oh, you're, that's, that's funny. <laughs> no, yeah. these were actually it, anarchist organizations. It, I mean, it, it, you know, it, to put Antifa in perspective, as scary as it might be to some people to be reading about, you know, the protests are embedded with these... These uh, these black bloc groups that bring hammers and, and nails and whatnot. The Symbionese Liberation Army kidnapped an heiress, turned her into a terrorist, and then robbed banks with semi-automatic machine guns. Yeah, in which people were killed. One, in which people were killed. So so you know the, the, we've been here before, and, yeah. and we've been worse, and we came out of it with flying colors. And that's that's kind of the point that I want to make to everybody is that. 
you know, we, we do tend to sometimes make light of it. I, I, one of my jokes is the reason I watch Mad Max movies is because they're training videos for me. <laughs> uh, Sherman, Sherman makes the exact same joke. Our friend Sherman yeah. Justice. From into the bay, makes the exact same joke that it's hysterical. Yeah, you know, like 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 twenty years from now, I do, and, and you know, by the way, Pat Oswalt makes that joke too. That he, you know, about he doesn't want to be the guy, you know, in the assless chap strapped to the front of a of a, of a pickup truck. Um, uh, playing, so, playing an electric truck. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, the, you know, but we we're going to come out of this with flying colors. We well, are. You know, the, the thing is, Wade, you and I are both at, at the crux of it. Historians. It's really, yes. That's what we do. Historians yeah. of cinema. Yes, but. Historians Historians sort of uh, uh, writ large. Uh, I mean, I was an actual American history teacher. Uh, so, so history allows a framework for things. And yes, uh, you know, the, the thing at the moment is definitely a, a horrible, terrible thing. But when you put it in the context of this long history, and I bring this up now because I'm going to talk about a few documentaries yep. that came out a couple years ago uh, uh, on the anniversary of the Rodney King riots, the Los Angeles uprisings. Uh, and history is a hell of a thing. History will calm you down. Oh, yeah. Uh, history will really, really, really take the sting off of whatever you're experiencing uh, in the moment, if you know history. So um, uh, Let It Fall, uh, the, the, the fantastic doc. Um, uh, I, is that, I think that's John Ridley's, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I believe it is. Uh, John Ridley, uh, uh, yeah. the, the, you know, uh, 12 Years Slave, a uh, noted screenwriter. Uh, yeah. John Ridley. yeah, and, and novelist. Uh, and novelist, you turn, baby. Oh yeah, Jim Band, you that Oliver uh, yeah. Stone movie that a lot of people did not appreciate. Oh, it. it's it's one of the few Oliver Stone movies I really <laughs> thoroughly enjoy. <laughs> Jennifer Lopez and Sean Penn are fantastic. I, but Billy Bob Billy Bob Thornton doing doing Twister is one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my entire life. I just love that. John really goes goes way back. John made this 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 wonderful documentary that he sort of um, uh, pieced together. But what's interesting about Let It Fall is that all of the actual principal persons involved in the central events. Uh, of the riots of the uh, the 1992 LA riots are in this uh, Damian Football Williams, uh, you know the the guy Henry King, Rodney King's father. They're all sitting there talking about the events of the day uh, and have a perspective on it, and it's really, really, really uh, interesting. Um, uh, so I don't know. Did, did you get a chance to see to, to see the the Let It Fall? Um, I do, I do. I think Let It Fall. Is, I mean, I think all three of these docs we're going to talk about are they are they aren't they aren't competitors. They are um, they're like World War II docs. They're like docs about any other historical event. They they contribute to a compendium of information. They work together. That's why I you know if everybody ever says to me like what's the you know when we just you know we're we're kind of in the World War One centennial still and. Uh, everybody's like, oh, yeah, the, the Ken Burns, that's the best of them. And I always like to say, look, there is no best of them. Mm. Watch them all. Mm. you got to see them all because these the historical events, the whole point of history, to come back to it again, and I was a history major before I was a film major, um, the point of history is to to not find that perspective. It's to find all perspectives and and to look at all points of view and all documents and to to – to try to find uh, not a truth, but all the truths. Mm -hmm. There are lots of things going on, and the more you know about it, you're not trying to come to a conclusion, you're trying to come to an understanding. Mm -hmm. And and uh, that's what I think uh, is a lesson we should take from the current moment, too. So, yeah, Let It Fall, absolutely excellent film. John Ridley did a, a great job, and um, for sure. Uh, let, let's move to the next one, then. Uh, LA 92, yeah. uh, which is, um, I, I, again, another uh, absolutely extraordinary documentary. This one... Um, I covered this I covered this on uh, on Film Week, too. This, this one is, is uh, all of the very raw footage that we see here, yep. um, uh, without a whole lot of commentary, except for the commentary that comes with the footage itself, mostly. Yeah. And, and considering that 92, we didn't have the surveillance state that we have now, where everybody's got a cell phone, where, you know... The, the, the footage there is primarily news footage mm -hmm. and private video footage with people who just happen to own cameras. Uh, today, everybody's got a camera in their pocket and on their phone and on their watch. And, uh, you know, probably half a dozen cameras mounted around the street, uh, you know, CCTV cameras. So whatever we get from this moment, 20, 30 years from now, 
will be more substantial even than what you get. And LA-92 is a pretty great job of putting together archival material. It really is yeah, an yeah. outstanding pers- film. In your perspective, it's a hell of a thing. So um, in this film, you see a lot of actual news anchors and news reporters. You see a lot of city officials being interviewed, Tom, Tom Brantley. And, and so you have this sort of official news uh, news filtered um, 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 examination of the events. As you say, uh, today it's going to be an entirely different thing because yeah. everybody will with a phone is out there sort of uh, catching a perspective about what was going on. L.A. Burning, the, uh, the riots 25 years later, the, the central interesting thing about this, there was this whole sort of thing that went on between the sort of black uh, and Korean communities uh, uh, during that period that, that uh, accrued back to the Latasha Harlins case. Latasha Harlins, I believe, was a little black girl who was killed by a Korean uh, um, a grocery store owner, uh, you know, and there was a whole complicated thing going on. This all had happened prior to the Rodney King beating. But it simmered. But it simmered for a long time yeah. for a whole bunch of different reasons, in, including the fact that the young, the, the uh, Korean the storefront owner was 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 um, acquitted of that crime. All right, fast forward a wee little bit to the actual riots jumping off. This documentary principally tells the story through the eyes of a guy named David Ju who owned a gun store in Koreatown. And he, and he describes a whole bunch of stuff, but specifically a set of gunfights that he had, he and his compatriots and some other folks, with some gang members and other folks, in the, like, the OK Corral yeah. style gunfights, of which there is footage yeah. in the show. And, they, and principally the thing that they talk about is the fact that the, the police sort of abandoned the situation completely yeah. and left them and left them on their own. Um I don't know, man. Did you happen to see this one? It's, like, I, I, it, it's one that's been on my list for a long time, and uh, I, I was hoping to get to it before we did the show today, and I just haven't been able to. I haven't been able to get my put my head in that space. Um, it's but, so compelling. By the way, yeah. folks, you can watch uh, at least that one at the A and E website. If you, if you click over there, the entire that entire two hour series uh, is streaming. Yeah. Uh, so you, 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 that one's easy to find. But, but interesting, interesting to look back at that from the purchase of this, both of us uh, having, uh, you know, experienced both of these moments in history here in this city, our city that we love, um, um, and sort of uh, put them in the sort of like gigantic framework. Now, as much as we're talking about how L.A. burned, uh, I mean, it's in the title of almost every one of these films, L.A. burning, L.A. burned, yeah. <laughs> you know, let, let it fall, all of that. The fact of the matter is South Central Los Angeles, which they don't call South Central No, they call it South L.A. now. They call it South L.A. now. Um, is ha, has been for the last 25 years a thriving community yeah. uh, where, frankly, even gentrification is starting to creep into. Yeah, they Inglewood, been... Inglewood <laughs> ain't the Inglewood of 92. That's not the Lakers Inglewood no. uh, anymore. You know, it's it's uh, there are some very very nice condos to be had there. Yeah, for about a yeah. million dollars a plot. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, that's not the Inglewood. Yeah, our friend Francesca lives in Inglewood. So so did did they let it fall? Did L.A. burn? It did. But you would we would be remiss if we did not point out that South, uh, James, uh, who was uh, Magic Johnson, came in and built that. That, uh, yeah. that beautiful mall. Baldwin, Baldwin Hills. Hills. Baldwin Hills. In Baldwin Hills with that wonderful theater. Yeah. All kinds of uh, grocery stores. L.A., downtown, uh, South Central L.A. had been a food desert for 35 years. Uh, there was no Ralph's, the, you know, the major grocery store yeah. chain. And I reason there at all. All of that stuff in, uh, over the course of that 25 years uh, went into that community. So, yes, uh, it, it was a hell of a riot. And, uh, and, they, and they burned it all down. But it came back, and it came back really, really strong. And I can see that, you know. So, so even as you know, things burned the last few nights, I already know what's going to happen uh, because I'm we're going to come back. back. We're going to yeah. come back. You know, the in, in, a, in a strange kind of timely twist of fate, too. You know, we uh, we've been getting my daughter to sort of open up her experience to more movies, and she's she's a little always been a little apprehensive about watching movies she's not already seen, meaning anything outside of the Disney Princess Compendium. Uh, but she, you know, wanted to see, uh, starting on May 4th, Star Wars Day, because her friend Ethan really, really loves Star Wars. She decided she wanted to see the Star Wars movies. So we watched all nine Star Wars movies in about two weeks, uh, including all the PG-13 ones, which is, is a hell of a leap for a, for a seven-year-old. Yeah. Uh, a little bit scary in places, but, you know, it's okay. And, and then, uh, she wanted to see Zootopia. And, you know, we watched Zootopia right in the pocket of this moment. And that is a remarkably prescient 
and meaningful movie because um, all of our cities are Zootopia mm. in the world. And Zootopia is it, the whole point of that movie is how do predators and prey learn to live together um, when there is this sort of inherent distrust. And um, whether you consider yourself predator or prey depends kind of on your perspective. Mm. Um, uh, but it's what that movie says is really wise and how it goes about it is not preachy. It's organic to the story. And, uh, that's a great film for families to watch together, to be able to talk about a lot of the issues that are, um, kind of on everyone's mind right now. So I would, I would say definitely put Zootopia in your family movie queue. It's right there on Disney plus and everybody seems to have Disney plus these days. So, um, you know, that's that's something that was good for us to watch. Kind of lives right there in the same space with uh, Animal Farm. Who's the animal? Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, kind of, kind of, I want to do I want to do a couple of a couple of recantations. I want to recant a couple of uh, uh, things about two films that I still don't like. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but 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 nevertheless, um, in, in, in the context of my of, of my reviewing them, of my analyzing them, uh, I you know I said some stuff about them that in the, that in the context of things today I have to I have to a little bit take back. So the films are Detroit and Harriet, um, uh, and uh, so for Detroit, I wrote this big old essay. It was really more of an essay than it was a, a, a review about Detroit. And one of the things I did not like in Detroit is the depiction of the brutality um, uh, against the black folks in that movie, against black bodies specifically. Uh, if you watch Detroit, um, uh, the, 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 the officers, um, do some very, very vicious things, uh, to the black characters, you know, that ostensibly represent things that probably, that, that actually happen. You know, one, one, one supposes if, if, um, was it Catherine Bigelow, I think. Yeah. If she, if she did a research. Right? Okay. So fine, fine. Um, um, but I did not like the notion of once again having to, to watch that in, in, in a piece of cinema. I felt like it was gratuitous, yeah. uh, at least. Um, uh, but, I think we all, we all compared it to, to a horror film, which it yes, kind of becomes at a certain point. Exactly, exactly. I, we talked about that. But in, anyway, I, in, in, in the light of the, the, the events captured uh, of what happened to Mr. Floyd, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I just have to say, okay, well, you know what? Sometimes I guess you do have to show it. Um, um, cause you know, it, it, watching that video, cause I generally speaking, don't watch those kinds of videos, videos of, yeah. of, of, of horrible moments, uh, for anything, you know, yeah. I was never a guy who watched the beheading videos that were all the rage no. back. Then. I never watched a single one. Um, um, uh, but that one I watched, what, what happened to Mr. Floyd. And I, and I, and I do believe that you have to watch it. You have to see it and it has to affect you in that way. So to the extent that. Uh, Catherine Bigelow's intent in Detroit was to evoke something like that. I'm going to go ahead and give her the benefit of the doubt um, regarding that stuff in that movie. Okay, Catherine. So yeah, one back for you. <laughs> uh, Harriet. I, I took issue with uh, this uh, a, a few characters, but but the central character in Harriet that was this black bounty hunter who was hardcore hunting down the, the black bounty hunter, slave hunter. Yeah, uh, he was trying harder to catch Harriet uh, than anybody else in the entire movie. It seemed like he had a more vicious uh, desire to to uh, to overcome and abuse and, and and drag her back into slavery than than anybody else in that film, and that bugged me. I'm like, I got, I'm thinking to myself, we we have a film that's set during slavery time, and the worst person in it is a black dude. <laughs> and I'm mm. like. I'm like I, I know I think I'm thinking maybe a white dude on <laughs> <laughs> if during during the film set during slavery time. But nevertheless, effectively, you know, we have to remember that um, uh, for black folks, for you know, for for particularly for uh, for actually enslaved Africans who came here, the the bounty hunter was more or less um, a police officer, an authority figure. That person had the authority to go out and catch a slave, a black person, and bring them back. Not exactly a cop. But had had authority over what they could do to us, kind of in that way. Now, as I as I was riding around on the nights of the first night of the riots, and yes, I was I was riding around after that curfew. I certainly was. Shot some fantastic stuff out the back of the car, by the way. Um, I could not I could not ignore the fact that as many of those police officers and National Guard troops, for that matter, but certainly police officers, were 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 black African American, uh, as as there were white ones. Uh, I, I I can't I can't pretend like that doesn't exist. There are plenty of black cops. One of the cops who were standing there 
while George Floyd was being Floyd was being killed. Kind of looks like a black guy to me. Kind of looks like a black guy. I think yeah. one of them's a Hmong from the Hmong yeah. community. Yeah. Oh, the guy, you know, brother, you look kind of brothery <laughs> to me. This is this is a conversation that black folks are having. Uh, you, we, you, we are amongst our saying, hey, you know, one of those guys is a brother. Uh, uh, and, and and so I criticized that character in Harriet. Uh, but again, to the extent that Cassie Lemons, director of that movie, uh, her intention was to recognize that in this continuum of abuse, um, there exist these people, too. And and we have to go ahead and recognize that and, uh, and and not pretend like it's not there, because, you know, around this country, as we talk about police and police brutality, I, I would reckon that there are nearly as many black chiefs of police, particularly in big cities. Yep. As there are white ones. So, you know, so a lot of a lot of these police departments that have people doing things. The guy at the top of that police department is very often a brother or a sister. Uh, and and so you know I I just I just want to go ahead and recognize so one back for Cassie and Harriet there too. Uh, the we should talk about the films of 1992. That's something you and I were were getting into as well. That you know what what are the movies from that moment and in '93 that came out of that moment. And it's very you know the, the films of '92 were were really great. I mean one of them was Reservoir Dogs, which. I remember particularly well because one of the things I did at the 1992 Cannes Film Festival was sit on the beach and interview a young filmmaker named Quentin Tarantino who was really excited that he didn't have to work at a video store anymore, that he now had a career as a filmmaker because mm. he made his little $2 million or $1 million movie, Reservoir Dogs. It was getting all kinds of success, and it was, it was a hit at uh, Sundance. It hadn't opened here yet, but we sat on the beach. And we talked about, you know, kung fu films and black exploitation films and, uh, you know, the, the exploitation films of the 60s and all that, all that stuff that has shown up in his movies ever since. Mm. I, I thought I could stump him by dropping uh, mention of one obscure movie that I didn't think he would have uh, heard of that was, uh, that I thought was influential, perhaps, of Reservoir Dogs. Oh, man, did he know it. He, he knew it and he, <laughs> qu he quoted it right back to me. So it was, uh, you know, I remember that very well. Um, Ironically, that was also the year of Malcolm X, South mm. Central, um, Unforgiven. Mm. It, 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 the, the, the range is, is really – look, I interviewed uh, uh, I, I, for a junk at Tupac Shakur that year. Tupac was for a film for the film Juice, Ernest yeah, Jefferson's that's uh, right. uh, 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 directorial debut. Um, I also happened to interview that year uh, uh, Robert Downey Jr. for Chaplin, which came up. These two young men. Uh, uh, Tupac was a really, really interesting conversation. Interviewed him in Westwood. He was 19. I was 29. Literally 10 years apart. We were both born in July. Um, Tupac, in that interview, uh, did a number of things that I thought were, were, were outstanding. For one thing, he completely and totally owned that space. Owned it completely. Yeah. Now, in, 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 in our conversation... Tupac used what we insist on calling the N word about fifteen times, <laughs> mm -hmm. which, which it, 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 being a generation apart, it was a little shocking to me, you know, because I'm from that NAACP, Martin Luther King, so you know, you know, and the, you, don't, yeah. you don't talk. Now, this is what I came to understand about Tupac and that generation. He would not be told by anyone on earth what he could say, what words he could use. He knew that he had the ability to express himself and that if you didn't understand what he was saying, that was going to be on you, not him. Uh, at the same time that he used the N-word 25 times, he quoted Shakespeare another 25 times. Whole passages from Hamlet he did in our interview. So, you know, this is, this, 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 this is a complete person uh, who – marshaled all of his ability to communicate what he wanted to communicate. And that was a, an amazing interview. And it changed the way I thought about uh, the, the way I was going to interact in the world, in the world, particularly with respect to that word that we, we insist on calling the N-word, which I never call the N-word, by the way, folks. I'm just being nice here on the podcast. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the, when, I use that word whenever I want to use that word, but I use it knowing full well that I can make myself understood when I use it. Uh, and I've used that word on NPR, National Public Radio, and they, <laughs> and they did not beat me. Um, uh, they warned folks that I was going to use it, but they didn't beat me. 
uh, because I, it, it, it's, it's a matter of simply being able to, it's like aloha. Aloha means hello and goodbye. And depending on when and how you say it, uh, you, that's, you know, that's what you mean. Context. Um, so, so it was just, just, context is absolutely everything. So that was a very, very interesting year. I learned a lot from that. Now, uh, all of those movies from 1992, of course, were being sort of conceived and produced and made in 1990 and 1991 and maybe even a little bit earlier. So the events of 1992, the, the Rodney King riot, 1991 and 1992, uh, the Rodney King beating and the eventual riots um, were, were happening actually when these movies were in theater. But these movies were all conceived well before those events. So you think about a film like Do the Right Thing, right? Yeah. Spike's film comes out in 1989. Uh, you know, I interviewed Spike many times back then. I know when he conceived of that film and when he was shooting that film. And that film, the end of that film, um, has uh, Bill Nunn, Radio Rahim, being choked to death by the police. A riot ensues. This is a full three years before what happens to yeah. Rodney King in that riot, and a full 28 uh, years, uh, you know. Before today. Before today. It, it seems like he's pressuring it, but he's not really pressuring it. He's in the moment. He's just in the moment, but the moment, you know. So uh, really, really interesting sort of stuff. So right this very moment, uh, folks are out there making movies, right? It, it, movies yeah. uh, that will be informed by this moment. It'll be so interesting. So we talk about 1993. So it'll be so interesting to see what the films of 2020, you know, 2021, 2022 will have to say, just like the films of 1993 had something really interesting to say about the events of 1991, 92. Well, the films of 93 is, is a really, really interesting subject to get into. Uh, you know, in all the years that I've been reviewing movies, 1993 is still my favorite year. Mm. And, and I look at that, you know, 90, it's, it, for me, it was sort of an interesting three year arc, 92, three and four, uh, where the, I went to the Cannes film festival, all three of those years in a row. And, uh, they were all amazing years and they all had something extraordinarily challenging happening in them. Uh, the riots happened right on the eve of 92 in 93, later that year, we had massive, uh, the Topanga fire that nearly oh. burned down my home, and oh. I had to evacuate with five flames licking at my car. Um, you remember that. Oh, my God. Uh, that was a horror, and thinking that we'd lost it all, and then coming back, uh, you know, a, a day later, and finding out it was all still here, but that that uh, the bitter part of that was that five of our neighbors were all oh, burned out. All, all around you. I mean, all it, around it was, like, it was like it was like it just skipped over your house. It just, I mean, my it God. Was, it was, it was, it was quite, a, it was, it was truly the, the emotional thing of a lifetime. And then 94, thinking, okay, we got the riots and the, uh, and the fires out of the way. Let's, let's have a nice year in 94. And on Martin Luther King Day, 1994, the Northridge earthquake, tore LA down to the, down to its roots. And, uh, you know, so it was, those were three fascinating years, rough years, but years in which I have a perspective on with the movies, the movies are kind of still there. And, and I associate the movies with the events, whether or not I should. And the thing that, that 93 is so resonant to me about is that after all of the, the, the things that happened in 92 with the riots and, and with, uh, what what we thought was going to be societal breakdown, we wound up with an incredible crop of films, global films, but American films in particular, um, that uh, that I have not seen the likes of in the rest of my film reviewing career. Three, I, I have a rating system, my own personal rating system. Whenever I see a film, it helps me figure out my top ten at the end of the year. Anytime I see a film, right afterwards, I give it a zero to one hundred rating and put it in a database, and then I can call it up. And I have given maybe 10 to 12 films a 100 over the past 28, 9, 30 years. Mm. Um, three of them were in 1993. Remains of the Day, The Joy Luck Club, and uh, if, actually um, um, four. The Piano, Farewell My Concubine, mm. uh, The Joy Luck Club, and Remains of the Day. That's also the year of Schindler's List, which I didn't give a 100 to, but I gave it a 90-something. Mm. And... Um, you know, Schindler's List went on to be one of the all-time great Oscar winners, Steven Spielberg's first best picture, only one to this day. Uh, and th all of those are really, on some level, incredibly hopeful movies. Um, Farewell, My Concubine, perhaps less so, but uh, there's, there's a 
there's hope from nine, coming out of 92, we get a lot of these movies that have dark edges, mm. but they all are looking at something positive. Another one I want to call attention to is Poetic Justice. Oh. Uh, John Singleton, who came who we, of, lo- who we lost what last year was just last, last year, year yeah. uh, you know who who came of age with 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 Boys in the Hood, which has one of the most devastating moments of of the '90s in it, which is is when um, is the that 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 alleyway shooting. Oh, Morris Chestnut. When yeah. Morris Chestnut gets taken down, and it's 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 just gut wrenching. No, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, the poetic justice. I was I was thinking of boys. You, you talk well, about I'm boys talking about boys in the hood. Boys, I'm talking yeah, about yeah, boys in the hood. Boys, chestnut, yeah. That 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 John Singleton came out of that and in '93 gave us Poetic Justice, which is a beautiful film. Which going back to Tupac, Tupac shows a side in that film. You want to talk about you know how how deep he was. He shows a side in that film that that is not part of his public persona. He's funny. No. He's charming. He has timing. And Janet Jackson plays a character we've never seen before, which is, um, put, put race aside, a young girl who is a poet and expressing herself in an artful way that kids that age typically are not supposed to. That is a transcendent figure for a major director who's now expected to make gang warfare movies his entire career to say, you know what? I want to make a movie about a girl who's a poet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's an amazing risk that he took, and and it pans out. And there's and, and, ri- and, and again, a film about hope. They, they, about, about hope. Justice is, is fully a film that's hopeful. That that uh, family reunion scene is beautiful. My Angelou and everything. It's, 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 it's everything. And by little way, lucky, little as, lucky. As, as, as a guy who's been to a whole bunch of those family reunions, those black yeah. family reunions, you know, it was it's, it runs nothing but verisimilitude. Yeah. Uh, in, in in that scene, hysterically funny and fantastic. Um, uh, and, and, you know, and that's, and that from the guy who, again, uh, you know, gave us boys in the hood yeah. and, and for that matter, Rosewood, you know? Yeah. Um, um, uh, so yeah, uh, my wife, uh, was in both, uh, the last action hero and, uh, uh, menace to society. Uh, uh so, so th- that was pretty fantastic for me. Menace uh, to society uh, gave us the Hughes brothers. That was, yep. that was their big breakthrough, uh, which was significant because honestly, it, until that point, as far as black filmmakers, there was sort of Spike Lee, and then suddenly there was John Singleton, and then yeah. suddenly with the Hughes brothers, the floodgates opened up, and and there and was the a, it was a whole new generation. Didn't just do the black film thing; they you know they they uh, you know you know, horror movies and uh, from hell. Uh, from yeah, Hell is a great movie. Um, uh, so so that was a wonderful thing to see happen too, because you know you you had Matty Rich, uh, who had did I I guess that was Sidewalk Stories. No, that was uh, Charles Lane. That was Charles. Charles Landon Simon Maddie stories, and Matty Rich, Matty Rich did uh, straight out of straight out of straight, straight out of Brooklyn. Brooklyn. That's it, yeah. Straight out of Brooklyn. Yeah, so you had this little fall. You had um, uh, just another girl on the RT. Yeah. Uh, uh, Leslie, I can't remember her last name. Film. Um, so you had this little little moment there I, uh, where these little movies were being made. I did not realize that Bridget was in Last Action Hero. Yes, Bridget's in Last Action Hero. She yeah. plays a hooker. So no, <laughs> that's she's, so she's funny. The, she's in that big. That 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 big uh, police station scene that I think they actually shot what at the MGM studio, yeah, uh, in the MGM Studios building, which is a very modern looking building, back in 1992. Well, I the, when I look at all these movies of of that year of '93, they, they there's a there are two themes that kind of jump out at me here, and one is a theme of family and inclusion, which is part of poetic justice. It's part of in the name of the father. Mm-hmm. Which is which is which you know also has a very strong justice angle to it in Ireland. Um, it's part of Sleepless in Seattle. It's mm-hmm. part it's part of true romance. Oh, absolutely. You know, um, it's definitely in Remains of the Day. The Joy Luck Club is all about family and generation and immigration and and uh, you know uh, the, the the separation between the two. Even Tombstone manages at the end of the day yep. to be about family. Yeah, uh, the, 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 the Kurt Russell. Absolutely, it does. Absolutely, it does. You know, the it, it, and, I, and, and let me touch on because we're talking about L.A. again coming out of 92 and then Joel Schumacher making what I still think is the best film of his career, uh, Falling Down, ah. a film which got ripped to shreds by a lot of critics here. And that was out of competition. It might have been in competition, actually, at the Cannes Film Festival in 93. And I remember so many people hating falling down here, and I loved it. You and I, I were... It. We loved that movie. We loved Eddie that Rose movie. Smith, uh, Michael, Michael Douglas. Ugh. 
And and it was fascinating. I remember the press screening at the National Theater, where I had once worked when I was in my first year in college, uh, which has since been torn down. Curse them. But uh, I remember the press screening there at the National falling down, and, and I just thought, this movie's brilliant. And everybody was so angry, and I couldn't get it. And they're, they're like, don't you understand? This movie is, you know, it's, it's, it's racist, and it's, it's this, and it's got all this. And they were all so kind of offended by it. I said, you, you, you don't get it. You're missing the You're point missing of this. You're point. missing the point of the movie completely. And then I went to Cannes, and the press went nuts for it. The international press loved it. And it was fascinating to see that the people who live in the shadow of the movie, in Los Angeles, where the movie is set, we're too close to all the issues. They're too close to it. They couldn't see what the film was doing. People on the other side of the world, the French press, the German press, the Russian press, the Chinese press, all of them, they, they saw it and they got it because they had perspective. They were far enough away from it that they could kind of see themselves in it, that they could project a little bit more, more uh, objectively. And um, uh, the, the press conference for that film was fascinating. And Joel Schumacher said exactly that to a question that I asked. And, uh, you know, out of all the questions that were, that were going, I, you know, this little press room that's, you know, about 150 people can squeeze into the press, uh, press conference room. And I asked him, and I said, Mr. Schumacher, you know, I just came from Los Angeles. And he said, so did I. I was like, oh, good. Uh, and, and I said, you know, uh, a lot of people were really, really down on the film there. And then, and clearly this room is not what, to what do you attribute that? And he, he said, you know, if you live in Los Angeles, this movie is right in your face. Mm. It's all right in your face. And he said, and when I, and he basically went on to, to say, and I'm, I'm sure I'm paraphrasing like crazy here, but uh, and the video exists somewhere. It might even be on on the extras of the of the, the, the DVD or Blu-ray. But he he basically said that it's that that does make it hard to sort of step back. And and he said people thought the movie was about this guy played by Michael Douglas, defense. Mm -hmm. He said, it's not about a guy. It's about two guys. But if you're too close to it, you're going to miss the fact that Robert Duvall is the other guy. It's about both of them. And, uh, and, and one guy has cracked. Oh, he's broken when the movie begins. He's broken when the movie begins, and it just pushes him over the edge. And the other guy is trying to keep it together with his crazy wife and his job and everything else. He's holding it together. And, it, and, and ultimately, Falling Down, think of the title, Falling Down. It doesn't say Fallen Down. It's Falling Down. Mm -hmm. Both of these men are in the process of falling down. One of them ends the movie on his face. The other one catches himself and stands back up again. Fall, falling down is a poetic evocation of an action. And just because you're falling down, think of this moment. I want us to all think about this moment. Right now, we might feel like the world is falling down. You can be Michael Douglas and just keep falling. Or you can be Robert Duvall and catch yourself and do what happened to South Central L.A., now South L.A. in 92, pick yourself up again. Put it together again. Learn from the moment. Put everything back together. Um, and, and, and resolve as the world has done, as humanity has done in every tragic moment in our history, um, irrespective of cause or fault or, or anything else. Put it together. You can decide to fix your life, your community, you can do that. You don't have to fall down. So that seeing that again in 93, from 93, that just all kind of came back to me and, and resonated. Um, that there's a scene in that movie between Michael Douglas and uh, a character called the Economically Inviable Man, who's played, played by Bobby, Bobby, Bobby Curtis Hall. Yeah. Who, man's whose, man's wife, that whose wife, by the way, Casey Lemons. Casey Lemons. Casey Lemons of Harriet. Harriet. Yeah. As well as And... Um, that scene between Michael Douglas, they, they have a moment where they have the same yeah. time. Uh, the movie is in that moment. It is. 
It's right there between them. I think, I think they, they, they both have this moment of clarity. Yeah. Uh, they're doing the same thing, actually. Yeah. Blondie's just doing it with that sign standing there screaming for his, his right to be viable. Yeah. <laughs> I refuse to not be an economic viable. It's, uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful. Emmy Rose Smith, uh, I, he also wrote, um, was it The War with Kevin Costner and, um, oh, and Clint Eastwood, good, if I'm not mistaken? Good question. Um, uh, I'm almost certain he wrote that, too, which is another film from that period uh, about a guy who's kind of coming apart a little bit and a cop who's, who's, on, his, uh, who's on his heels. And, uh, and it's sort of the same thematically. Uh, I think we're both looking it up right now. Yeah. There he is. I'm pulling him up. He did, uh, oh, wow. He, he was an actor in Turner and Hooch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually, Eddie, Eddie Rowe is even in Falling Down. Um, uh, Good heavens! Uh, he wrote the screenplay for Car Fifty Four. Where are you? That's bizarre. That's I, I wouldn't tell. I wouldn't. I wouldn't mention that one. Yeah. Uh, if I were. so 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 yeah, man. What the you know, um, uh, a hell of a movie that is. Uh, falling down. Yeah. Um, we, we also had, we also had Groundhog Day. Yeah. Now <laughs> oh, now right. it, it, that's that's one we all obviously look back on with with great fondness, especially because we had a Super Bowl commercial this year that that referenced it. Um, maybe the most uh, lingering movie from 93 uh, for a whole lot of reasons. And I think <laughs> now we look back and if you were around in 92, it does feel like Groundhog Day. Uh, it feels like, you know, Groundhog Day is all about things are going to repeat themselves until you learn how to fix whatever isn't right. So if things keep repeating, you know, let's let's try to try to fix them again without, uh, you know, the, communication is always key to fixing things. Um, you know, Last Action Hero, I want to make a quick mention of that, too. One of the, the most entertaining junkets that I've ever gone to, and this has nothing to do with anything relevant. I was, but that, I, I was at that junket. But, I'm, but I'm, I'm going to share this anyway. The, the, uh, I was in a room with um, my friend Bruce Kirkland from Toronto, who's uh, semi-retired now, but an amazing film critic. And, uh, and Schwarzenegger came in. Uh, and I've only ever seen three movie stars take over a room, by the way. Only three. Completely own a room and just force everyone to submit to their, their, their charisma or whatever else. And they all do it different ways. Schwarzenegger, Russell Crowe, and Will Smith. Those are the yeah. only three I've ever seen do that. Will Smith does it just by sheer charm of being your buddy. He's just so charming and so magnetic and so nice and so sweet. Uh, Russell Crowe basically bludgeons you into it. He comes in with so much attitude and, and aggression that you, you just submit. <laughs> it's really, it's just kind of, uh, and Schwarzenegger's somewhere kind of between the two. He's, he's, uh, he's intimidating, but he's charming. And he came in, and Bruce, who is a birder, not a bird watcher, a birder, uh, mm -hmm. and, and very, very Canadian, and, you know, Bruce, uh, Bruce was wearing this, this vest that he wore, which has, you know, it has sort of like, uh, indigenous tribal embroidery on it and had a, you know, it's a very kind of Canadian thing to wear. And um, Schwarzenegger came in, put his hand out to shake, which you wouldn't do right now with the pandemic, and Bruce put his hand out, and Schwarzenegger, this was so intentional, went right past his hand, grabbed his vest, and felt the fabric. <laughs> and, and he said... Oh, that's a very nice curtain you're wearing. Do, <laughs> do they make it for men too? <laughs> and we and and Bruce laughed as hard as anybody else in the room. Oh. It was it was just. And, but in that moment, that was Schwarzenegger. But but um, the Last Action Hero is like a lot of these other films that we're talking about here. Very uh, introspective. It is. If you've never seen silent films, you, I recommend as a double feature Last Action Hero. And Sherlock Jr., the mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Buster Keaton film, which is very much like it. Now, you could also throw Purple Rose of Cairo in there, which mm -hmm. is kind of, they're sort of a triumvirate of movies about movies where you go into movies and movies mm -hmm. come out at you. But Last Action Hero is really the Schwarzenegger action version of Sherlock Jr. And there's that one scene where, where his character says to himself, you don't know how much pain you've caused me. Um... We're talking about perspective, about you know seeing things through through different eyes. That's that's a great moment because people too often, where movie stars are concerned, think, oh, you've got a ton of money and you know you got all the the, the, the privilege and advantage in the world, and uh, you know I don't feel sorry for you. Um, I 
I've talked to enough movie stars. You and I have interviewed mm. enough enough mm-hmm. celebrities. Um, money and success only goes so far. It, it doesn't buy happiness. Oh, I, there's so there, I, there are so many more whom I know enough about personally and understand their, 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 their existences personally, where I can say very, very specifically, I would not swap shoes, no. swap lives, swap existences with them for all of the money, fame, power stuff that they have. Yeah, uh, you, you, you knowing the things that I know about about you know, so ah, you never a bazillion years. Yeah, um, you you were going to let me give a shout out uh, to uh, uh, the 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 Fine Arts Film Festival. Yes, and um, and um, and I, I did a little interview um, um, of, a, of a of a of a young female artist, young um, uh, Latinx woman, Mariah Marquez, and the producer of a little film that she made, uh, The Diary of Being Uncomfortably Comfortable. A wonderful little 13 minute short film that she made before all of this happened. And, and Neil Cohen, uh, of course, is a good friend of ours. You and I interviewed him yep. for his film um, uh, a couple, a couple, a few years ago. Um, and, uh, and Neil, of course, is one of the producers of my film, uh, Miss Daisy. Uh, so, so Neil ran into this young woman, uh, and, and, and she had been doing some work for him on um, uh, a book that he wrote called American Gargoyles, making little short commercials for that. And she, she wanted to do a little movie, so he sort of, you know, sponsored her and. And she did this excellent little short film, which is going to be in the Fine Arts Film Festivals. Now, film festivals, film festivals, as we know, are generally speaking, not happening. Con, not yeah. happening. Uh, yeah. Although they did release a list of the the uh, films, the, the films, the selections, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is an interesting thing to do, nevertheless, because it still has a promotional value. Yeah. Um, so, it, it, so this little film festival, the Fine Arts Film Festival, is going to be virtual. Uh, this year it runs from June eighth to June fourteenth, but you can you can go watch the films anytime because you can find links to them. Yeah. Uh, but there's a, a voting period where you can pick some. So um, the the Fine Arts Film Festival. The name of this little film, fifteen minute film, is called Uncomfortably Comfortable. I sat down with Neil and Mariah Marquez, and we had a wonderful little chat about that and, and about being an up and coming young filmmaker. And um, it's uh, it's really interesting. I hope everybody will go see the movie as well as listen to this interview. So we're gonna have that. Uh, we're gonna pop that interview in right at the end of the show. And uh, so keep a, keep an ear out for that when we finish, when Tim and I finish uh, rambling all this stuff. Um, just a, a few more films from the uh, from from '93. Uh, we forget that was also the year of Jurassic Park. Ah, uh, changed yeah. everything. The one that I really loved. The, the first big CG movie. That was that was it. That's the one that, that flipped the flipped the tables on CG. It's the one where I bought the CG. Yeah. Where where where, where I decided, you know what. That dinosaur is there. Yeah. Uh, that that was the one that gave me that moment for the very first time watching a big CG movie. Generally speaking, you know, I hate. Yeah. 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 Uh, but that one, I was like, you know what? I'm going to see that dinosaur is there. I'm going to let it go. And then I watched the rest of the movie. Uh, Days and Confused, uh, which uh, which gave us Matthew McConaughey. Yeah, uh, and, 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 and a contemplative filmmaker, which we didn't have a yeah. whole lot of. At that particular time, Richard Linklater. Uh, Richard Linklater, and and he's he's continued to be a contemplative filmmaker yeah. over the course of the la- of the next you know almost thirty years. Uh, he's a, a filmmaker who's actually thinking about life and you know boyhood and whatnot. Uh, and that and that movie there, I suppose, was a sort of quintessential example of a guy just wandering around. Uh, yeah, you know, being it, busy. and and days and Confu- I mean, a, a Parker Posey came out of that movie too. Yeah. Um, Matthew McConaughey, a ton of people came out of that movie. As that cast really that lit up. It was, in many respects, a, a more influential film from the cast standpoint than something like Saint Elmo's Fire, mm. uh, the Joel Schumacher movie, uh, Nightmare Before Christmas. Yeah, yeah. you know, yeah, Tim Burton, Tim, Tim Burton, Burton, Tim Burton, and, and Henry Selick, and a, 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 a classic. Now, I don't think any of us looked at it, thought of it as a classic before, but you know, fusing uh, Halloween together with Christmas. If you go to Disneyland around the end of the year, that is a real thing because they take the haunted house just before uh, Halloween and they set it all up with a, a Nightmare Before Christmas theme with Jack Skellington and everything, and they keep it there through the end of the year. So it, it makes that a very special ride from Halloween through Christmas and into the beginning of the year. So for a, a good solid almost third of the year, um, uh, at least, you know, more than a season, uh, that movie has turned, generates one of the, the best theme park attractions at any, any Disney park. Um, the Fugitive. Oh, wow. Talking yeah, about movies about... Adaptation of a, 
of a television. Yeah. Like, where, where in fact that movie was more engaging than that television show with David Jansen ever it, actually was. Incredibly so. Really shockingly so. Uh, you know, they, they, I didn't, ex no one expected that movie to be as good as it wound up being and to get an Academy Award nomination for Best Picture and Harrison Ford, a Best Actor nomination. Uh, Really did an amazing, amazing job. Fugitive, kind of one of the transformational action films of the of the period. Um, two movies with with cities uh, in their titles that have recently uh, had a really, really rough time. But both of these movies also very, very hopeful. Philadelphia and Sleepless oh, in Seattle. Oh, the pairing of Tom Hanks and Denzel Washington in Philadelphia was just a piece of genius, genius, yeah. genius casting. It was the exact right casting of the exact right people and the exact right parts. Uh, Jonathan Demi film, of course, uh, Tak Fujimoto's uh, cinematography. Um, it looks, uh, Tom Hanks uh, and Denzel were already big movie stars at this point, so it's not like um, anybody was made into a movie star here. But what, what was astounding about this movie was how both of them transcended their movie stardom. Uh, Tom Hanks uh, became character, uh, and you bought that he was this young gay man uh, with uh, with HIV uh, AIDS uh, uh, fighting this good fight and Denzel Washington uh, this black lawyer uh, who had to overcome a little bit of, of what were, were this sort of um, uh, uh, suspicions about HIV and whatnot in order to do the job that he needed to do to 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 um, defend this man to, to fight that case. It's a beautiful, beautiful movie. Great work by the late Jonathan Demme. It, it is it is incredible to think that you could take those two stars and put them in the same movie and not have their stardom completely overwhelm the film. They are able, and, and I give Demi all the credit in the world for this, they are able to subdue their own superstar magnetism and serve the story. And that's really an extraordinary thing. That was, you know, Tom Hanks won his first, uh, his first Academy Award of two back-to-back. -back. He would win again the next year for Forrest Gump. Um, very impressive. Sleepless in Seattle, which... Is, oh, Nora, Nora Ephron, is, is, already. Yeah, Nora Ephron basically um, made one of the one of the, the archetypal quintessential romantic comedies of the period. Again, with two stars who were able to subdue their stardom for the sake of the movie. Again, one of them, Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan, and and um, you know. That was that was the era of Tom Hanks. It really, I mean, it kind of still is. He hasn't yeah, gone away. Still but, is, but 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 that yeah. young Tom Hanks period there, yeah, uh, where he could just about do no wrong. I mean, Joe versus the volcano, maybe, but I even like that. Um, you know, I uh, want I, I want to hit two uh, before we kind of start to wrap up. Two films that give me great hope for the future, and the future is always about the kids. And um, I'll tell you, as a parent, last week has not been easy. Uh, you know, the the question is. With the pandemic already, it's rough on kids. We've been homeschooling my daughter. And when I say we, I mean my wife. <laughs> because <laughs> I have not... It's The burden has really fallen to her, and she's been extraordinary. Uh, but, you know, it's you, you're doing Zoom sessions with the class. You're working with the teacher. But the parents are still all very involved in executing, basically being, you know, surrogate teachers and teacher's aides. And, and um, the kids miss each other, and they miss playing together. And the pandemic is not an easy thing to explain to them because you don't want them to all grow up to be terrified germaphobes who don't want to hug and, and, and play together and, and, you know, shake hands. You want them to come out of this with better social instincts and, and more humanistic instincts than they had going in. And so you got to figure out how to sort of transition the one to the other. And the, with what has happened in, since from, from, you know, uh, Minneapolis spreading out to all the other cities, it makes it really hard. So, you know, you, you, we've tried to sort of shield her from that. We don't want her to know. I mean, it, 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 and in point of fact, I do want to say this. You know, we have, we've made a very conscious decision to raise our daughter as long as possible with no conception of race. None whatsoever. And, and that, as a result, she has Uncle Tim, who just happens mm -hmm. to have brown skin. And she's got Uncle Nadim, who just happens to have kind of brownish skin and mommy and daddy have pinkish skin and she has friends and playmates and from school who are mixed race and who are all over the map and they're individuals to her they're people to her they're not groups they're not anything but who they are special people in her life and um 
I have to credit this year again for helping us in that because we named her for a character in Much Ado About Nothing, which Kenneth Branagh released in this year. Mm. And Kenneth Branagh, again, talking about hope, went from Henry V, uh, in terms of his Shakespearean films, he went from Henry V, yeah. which is a pretty dark and brooding movie. Unabridged, by the way. Oh, he, I mean, yeah. The movie's damn near the entire yeah. play. He got uh, just about all of it. And and to Much Ado About Nothing, which is which is a wonderful, sweet film. Again, it, you know, another Denzel Washington movie. It was Denzel yeah. Washington and, kind of, and, and Tom Hanks all year. Um, yeah, but, but look what he did in that movie. He cast Denzel Washington. Yeah, and I mean people get Don Pietro, uh, and and uh, and you know, and people are like, oh, Denzel Washington's a black guy. Yeah, and Kenneth Branagh, and a hell of an actor. Yeah, and you know, and, hey, yeah. there you go. Thank and, you, Kenneth. Thank and you, you know what? He Denzel makes Keanu a better actor in that movie. <laughs> he drags Keanu almost Put, up to their level. Puts uh, him on his coattails and drags him along. Uh, uh, Kate Beckinsale played hero, of course. Yep. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in the film. Uh, uh, so yes, yes, just so so wonderful, so lovely. And and uh, lastly, um, let's talk for a second about searching for Bobby Fischer, which you know, as long as we're talking about people with multiple credits in that year, Steve Zellian, who would win an Academy Award for writing uh, Schindler's List, wrote and directed Searching for Bobby Fischer, which is not really about Bobby Fischer. It's about a little boy, a little boy who's a chess prodigy, mm -hmm. and um, it, that is. That's an amazing movie. And you want to talk about reevaluating movies. I look back on that. I, I was a little tough on that movie at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought, you know, it's a little bit uh, a little bit too clever for itself. It's trying to be uh, kind of too too good by half. Uh, you know, the dialogue all felt very written to me. And it just felt... Well, Steve's alien, but yeah, go on. Yeah, but, you know, it's based on a book. And it just felt like they were just too... It's just too polished for its own good. It's just they're trying to pull my heartstrings. And I look back on that film now, and I and I think you know I was I was too tough on it because I think I was too young at the time, not a parent. Now that I am a parent, I understand what's going on in that movie. I understand that this the you know this, this little kid Josh, um, uh, surrounded by these amazing actors. And let's let's remember the adults that are that are that are in that no. movie. He's you know, Lawrence, Lawrence, Lawrence Fishburne, Fishburne playing speed chess with him in the park, trying to pull him up. You know, Joe Mantegna uh, as his dad, Joan Allen as his mom, Ben Kingsley, uh, just this, this so much gravitas. These are giant actors. At the time, Joan Allen was getting the Oscar nomination almost every year. She was having her Meryl Streep moment, you know. Mm. These are giant actors at the time who are... They're, they're creating a protective shell around this kid to elevate him and to bring him into a world that he's not ready yet, not ready for yet. Mm -hmm. A world that may not understand him for who he is. But, but that's ultimately what this movie is about, is be yourself. And if the world doesn't want to embrace you for who you are, don't change yourself for the world. Force the world to accept you for your dreams and your ambitions and your hopes. Because you will improve the world more than the world will improve you if the world changes to accommodate you versus the other way around. Um, people who change the world are the people who decide they're going to change the world, not the people who let the world change them. Ah, indeed, indeed, indeed. I love... Um... Lawrence Fishburne's character. I, I, look, I still don't have any kids, but uh, but I but uh, but uh, no, you got Fishburne, kids. You got kids. You just don't have kids of your own. Yeah. But but that Lawrence Fishburne character doing what he's doing, which is basically fathering. It's yeah. chess, yes, but never, he's nevertheless. It's not just about the chess. Yeah. Uh, um, there. So you know, um, um, uh, another another beautiful example. Those those and and honestly, those you know, I've been trying to teach my daughter a little bit of chess. Seven is slightly young. She, <laughs> when we play chess, it basically amounts to any time I take one of her pieces, uh, that apparently means that she immediately gets it back and gets to take one of mine. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure where that rule originated, but that's a rule that we apparently play with now. But, <laughs> but, um, but there, there is, uh, there, those, those scenes are so beautifully shot and staged in the park, the, the speed chess and, and Fishburne has 
such a wonderful modulation there in, in, in how he's being tough but caring. Tough but mm -hmm. caring. Um, very, very, uh, very, very underrated film. Searching for Bobby Fischer, also from 1993. So, um, you know, the, as we wrap the show out, I think the, the point that we want to make is that if history is any guide, um, from what 93 was in the wake of 92, we should be looking at 2021 and 2022 as amazing years for movies, healing movies, great movies, thoughtful movies, movies where, you know, when the tough gets going or when the going gets tough, the tough get going. I mean, it'll, I be, an, it'll be an interview again, the, the, the movies that we will be watching then. Yep. are being conceived and, uh, and perhaps not literally made right now because of the pandemic, but conceived and will be made very, very soon. They yeah. will be informed by yeah. the actual presence. Uh, one of the conversations that we're going to have perhaps in the future podcast, uh, we talked about Wade, is what films uh, you know set after January of nineteen yeah. uh, of, 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 of twenty twenty will look like. Yeah. Will 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 all cinema uh, include acknowledgement? of pandemics and masks and hand sanitizers yeah, uh, and, and have characters, uh, you know, acknowledging that in a movie that's set, you know, sometime uh, post 2020 or uh, will the world of cinema and television decide to pretend like this didn't happen? Well, uh, it, it, it's, it's going to be interesting. Nobody can predict the future, but we, uh, I, I can say, you know, that, that what Tim and I have said in terms of being historians of film and historians generally, um, We'll come out of this, and we'll come out of it better than we went in because we're resilient. Human beings are resilient. They they get past this. They they get past anything. And we've you know we've in the past hundred and some odd years. I mean I you know I often talk. My mother is my hero. I often talk about that. Um, uh, Tim, I know your parents are, are heroes to you too. Oh, you know yeah. my my father came through the depression. My mother you know was was a war refugee. Lost everything. Then got then came down with stricken with polio. Um, we lost my father when I was a kid. She, she was a young widow and, um, you know, tough lady. She, she went through a lot and, uh, I always look back on her and I, I think, uh, you know, she never complained. I got nothing to bitch about. Yeah. So, thank you. My, 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 my mama's, I like to call my mama straight gangster right now. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 bulletproof. She is bulletproof raised all of us. Uh, you know, you know, love my father. My father was there in my, in, in my life, a wonderful guy, a musician. I love my daddy. Uh, but my mama raised me, uh, yeah. and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and just about everybody else in our neighborhood. <laughs> so, you know, it's yeah. one of those, uh, this strong woman. The, the, the young woman uh, in, the, in the little film uh, that, that, that she made and is going to be talking about coming up here is about exactly that. This is a young woman who's going through some trials and tribulations in her life. She overwhelmed physical – she overwhelms them all, overwhelmed them all, and built herself a life anyway. I love that. All right, and we're going to go into that. And her name again, Tim, and the name of the uh, film? Mariah, Mariah Marquez. The name of her film is The Diary of Being Uncomfortably Comfortable, and it will be showing virtually at the Fine Arts Film Festival. You can find the Fine Arts Film Festival at fineartsfilmfestival.com and you can figure out a way to watch all of the wonderful little movies. I've been on the jury of that film festival once or twice uh, in my life. It's a lovely little film festival. All right, here we go. Without further ado. We have a lovely interview with a young filmmaker and the producer who found her. I'm going to let you guys introduce yourself, and then you're going to tell me all about your film uh, and becoming a filmmaker. Mariah Marquez, say hello to the folks. Hello, I am Mariah. Good to talk with you. It's funny. A few seconds ago, <laughs> we were trying to decide what to call you, and I asked you, um, yeah, what are we calling you? Are we calling you a filmmaker, a performance artist? Uh, and you said you didn't know. Neil, have Neil Cohen in the room, producer. I know what to right. call you. What are you calling your... Filmmaker. So he's a filmmaker. Uh, unabashedly. You know it for sure. Totally. All right. All right. I think we're going to call you a filmmaker, sis. Thank you. <laughs> just, 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 just for today. You did make a lovely movie, though, right? Thank tell, you. Tell, tell us about your movie, the title of your movie, and tell us what it's mm -hmm. about and what uh, inspired you to make this perfectly beautiful little poetic film. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, well, it is called Uncomfortably Comfortable, The Diary of Being. Uh, it's weirdly to say about myself and about all of our struggles really and the what we have in common through those struggles and how to rewrite your own story and to move forward through that and hopefully help others with your story um it's funny because I never really like I was telling you took myself seriously with it all film has just been a, a 
means of expression for me. Uh, so to go through this process, I, I met Neil a, a while back now. It's been a fun relationship. Uh, he works on, made a children's book and I just started taking some photos and videos for um, the marketing side of it and we got to know each other. Wonderful, talented, inspiring guy and believed in me a lot and was like, sat me down for coffee and was like, don't say I'm crazy and don't tell me no, but I want you to make this a film and I wanted to be about you and I was just like no <laughs> and um, this, this is interesting so the the very the, 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 that little nugget of it actually came from Neil but you 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 were thinking about making a film about yourself well I had in the past I just knew that my story was different and my whole life I've just been like whoa this is a movie it's really weird every like just the little pieces and stuff and um, I definitely wanted to find someone somewhere eventually in the future that I could trust with the idea and so the fact that he believed in me for it to be in my hands I was like well if I'm gonna ever do this why not start now and it can be in just our hands mm. yeah I mean I know so many people who have a wonderful wacky interesting fascinating personal story and somebody else comes along and does the version of their life they actually know them and uh, collaborate with them and then do a version of their life that looks absolutely nothing like them whatsoever mm. and so I was concerned actually genuinely concerned that somebody was going to come along, meet Mariah, hear her story, and say, gee, that's a great movie. I'm going to make that movie. And she would have nothing to do with the creation of the movie, and it wouldn't even be a good version mm. of her thing. So um, she had shot a bunch of little short promotional films for me, which kind of put my book on the map and sort of launched this weird T-shirt brand that I have. So oh, yeah, American Gargoyles. American Gargoyles. Yeah. And it was so successful that I said, you know, you got to take the time, uh, you know, and just do a short film version of your story. And what was so wonderful, I gave absolutely no producer direction. It was whatever you come up with, like, blow my mind. And it was so unconventional and so different and so exciting for me to see because the the movie some might say almost begins like some weird instagram post and lulls you into that you're going to be on some <laughs> beachy dreamy little trip and then a couple of minutes in it takes a turn to a place that you're just not ready for and i just love the picture Thank you. Uh, well, this is fantastic. Look, 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 uh, tell us how you actually met. I know she, she did some work for you. How did you actually actually meet? No. And when did the conversation uh, turn to filmmaking? How did you even know uh, that she? I mean, she made the little movies for you. We met at the skate park. We met at the skate park Mutual in Venice. Friends. I, I was mm -hmm. working with this um, uh, this young skater's so mom, Julie Daniels, mm -hmm. who's a very uh, accomplished sports photographer. And she's got a daughter named Quinn Daniels, who's kind of a, 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 a famous little kid who's a skater and a model. And we were doing something for American Gargoyles. And Julie Mariah wandered them. over and said, what you all got going on? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said, well, we're doing this video. And I had actually seen her on Instagram <laughs> because she would post these at one point, you were posting crazy pictures of trains and railroad tracks, and I'm a nut about trains and railroad freight trains. And I said, you were doing all that stuff about freight trains and this, that, and the other thing. I said, do you want to shoot a little video, put on, t you know, shoot a little video for American Garland? She said, well, what do you want me to do? I said, well, just do something that cracks you up and blows my mind. And we made a little deal. And she came. She said, when do you need it? And I said, I need it in a couple of weeks. She said, a couple of weeks? I'll have it in a couple of days. <laughs> and in a couple of days, she came back with this video of her skating in a dress to classical music. <laughs> it was so wild. It caught on, on Instagram. And next thing you know, my T-shirt's in like the highest end retail shop in L.A. because... Fred Siegel, Cup, they saw it and they said, we want that T-shirt. So that's how we started working together. That's just extraordinary. <laughs> uh, could you have, uh, at that moment, were you thinking about being a commercial director, a, for that matter, a narrative director or a documentarian? Were you thinking like that or was it just stuff you were doing? 
It's always been in the back of my mind. I definitely just out of circumstance never thought it was something that I could pursue. Um, So to have the opportunity come in, it made it a lot more realistic. And now it's something that I could see myself doing. And I guess I should consider myself now. And because there's more projects and more ideas and possibilities coming. And um, it's just all been really exciting. But no, it's always something that. Yeah, I did for expression. I mean, if I could just chime in from left field here, because we're having this conversation about film and filmmaking, and people are saying, well, gee, who is this person, Ryan Marquez and whatever. What I think the audience listeners should know is she showed up from a tiny little town in Texas and in Southern California, and within a, a year or eight, six or eight, her and a bunch of women that she met down in Venice mm. formed this women's Girl skateboard Shout out. collective <laughs> called Girl Swirl, which has now become not only a big thing in Venice, but like an international organization that empowers women. I mean, you could talk about that more than I can, because I've funny. been on a skateboard in my life. <laughs> yesterday was International Women's Day. Yes. Uh, uh-huh. So it's a very interesting thing. Girl Swirl, which, which is incorporated into your film. Mm-hmm. There's a part of that. Tell us all about Girl Swirl. Well, very serendipitous for myself. Um, Also in the film, I explained that I ran from a lot of unsafe matters in Seattle and I came down this way. I had moved there from uh, Texas for a while. And when I came down, I lived in my car and it was my sixth day here. Met some girls um, at the skate park and they were all just getting together to go skate that night, really casual. We didn't have a name or anything. And then that night it was just so much fun and magical. We were joking about like crew names and we were going to keep adding girls to a text chain. And it was all with just the intention to meet other women that skated and have common interest. And with the way that social media is these days, Oh, because we made an Instagram because the text chain was getting too big and we still wanted to like if you saw another girl skating, just go up to them and be like, hey, this is all of us girls around town that skate. These are our profiles like hit us up. Let's skate. And the Instagram just took off to other channels and then through that like stoked from the community. And so we threw a party just kind of being playful with it and being like, yay, like this is happening. What we didn't really have much in. Um, We had a lot of intention and heart, but we had no idea really where it was going. It's just all very serendipitous. Um, So we threw a party, so much more stoke, and then we were like, wait, this is could be big and we have so much potential and we have so much support and um one morning we were laying in the big bowl in the snake park and because we we can't really skate it too well yet uh it's really big (laughs) um and some of the girls had brought up the fact that we were laying there so casually but we're in venice the heart of in la in the world such a a problem of homelessness and the fact that people probably actually slept there the night before and sorry (laughs) and with the amount of support and love and growth that we've had we had to do more and so we we sat down and we thought about in our wildest dreams what would we do and so philanthropic efforts were on the top of that list and so we said let's throw a party again but this time raise money for a local nonprofit, and it was super successful and everybody came together and again it just kept growing and kind of morphing into I guess what it is now which we are an LLC um, owned by seven women and we work together and empower each other and our sisterhood and the LLC is hopefully going to grow into a nonprofit. We are running as a foundation at the moment and we do skate mentorships and after school programs. We've gotten to go to Mexico to the migrant shelters and pass out boards and do skate lessons with them. And we host biweekly skate meets and we still throw parties, which is really fun to raise money for local organizations. We're at 20000 a little more that we've raised um, for different organizations. And funds. You, you, you uh huh, yes. $20,000. Mm-hmm. That's outstanding. And cra- it's crazy. And But the thing is, what is so powerful and why it is growing the way it is is because it's all community based. We couldn't have done this without the same stoke and love and support of everybody coming together. And so. That's our our main mission is just 
bringing bringing people together and using their stories to help empower each other. That's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Tell, tell us about your story, you, your your actual personal personal story. Mm-hmm. Uh, start as early <laughs> as you want to. Let's 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 start at uh, let's start at age. Let's start at age. Let's start at six. Start at six. Six. Can okay. You remember six? Yeah, a little bit. So my dad is from Mexico. My mom's from Louisiana, and they were married when I was two and divorced when I was three. And then my mom raised me by herself until I was eight. And then I moved in with my stepdad and my family because they're all my family. Um, and then I, it's not too clear from there until age 11. Uh, at 11, I got really sick and got was admitted into Texas Children's Hospital. Um, at the time, they they had me on the 12th floor, which was the cancer patient floor. Um, so I was surrounded by a lot of kids my age and younger that were on isolation um, and couldn't leave their room, couldn't have visitors. Doctors had to go and they're suited, but I wasn't on isolation. I was allowed to roam the halls and have visitors. And so at that point, it to be honest, before 11, I remember being like sassy and talking back and just like full of it. <laughs> I was probably a little brat. Um, but during that moment, it really was a huge shift of like, whoa, I'm so grateful. Um, sorry. <laughs> I'm emotional. My mom cries during the credits of movies and then she falls asleep. <laughs> I get it from her. <laughs> We don't, um, we, we don't want to talk about criers. I think. I think uh, do we want to talk about I that? Know. <laughs> anyway, go um, so, yeah, from 11 to 17, it was just a lot of ins and outs in the hospital trying to figure out what was going on, different medications, just fogginess. Um, and at 17, it had gotten a lot worse, and they found a pileup, which could be cancerous, in my colon. And it was spreading to my lungs and my kidneys, so they had to do an emergency surgery and remove my um, small, uh, sorry, my large intestines, my appendix, and most of my rectum. And I had an ileostomy bag for about a year. And then, thankfully, now with modern technology, they were able to reverse it in, and I have a J-pouch. Um, and at that point, I was 18, graduated. I was always one of those that had plans to go to college like you asked me I was like no duh (laughs) um but then just circumstance over time I was like I have to hit the road I have to explore and get out for a moment so kind of like pushed myself out of town and came to California for the first time didn't too much work out went back home and then just kept hitting the road um as far as like creatively through all of that time I was involved as much as I could be in things um i did i took theater which was fun i got to be a uh, cinderella which was really fun cinderella wore combat boots so mm. it was like the punk version <laughs> and um yeah and then always like i said made little sh- short films of expression because i mean i just had what was around me and that's what i noticed is what's exciting about this process is finally being able to have the tools to branch out to where I'm not my only project anymore. I'm not the only thing that I see and that I'm around and can work with that. This is still, this film is still in that realm, but it's allowing me to hopefully go and be able to share other people, other people's stories as well. Mm. Um, So then I guess rewind. So there's a lot of like cuts and holes and things in the stories, but I ended up in Seattle Um, I was in a relationship. We split up. Um, I had mentioned in the film things got kind of unsafe there, and there are matters that I'm not really ready to get into. Um, Maybe in a future film. (laughs) Um, And, yeah, I I had to hit the road pretty quickly. Um, And my only option was my car. I didn't want to go home. (laughs) not because my family is an amazing, but being from the South, I think mm. you understand how hard it can be there. And I definitely want to go back and help make a change locally. You know, sometimes the the hardest obstacle is staying rooted and making a change in your space. So hopefully this is helpful with that as well. If, if y'all know what I'm talking about, <laughs> so I'm like <laughs> rambling out of my brain right now. Um, yeah, and then ended up here was like, oh, so anyways, I was like, where can I go in the U.S. that's sunny? Because 
health wise over there it's really dark and cloudy and I really wasn't doing well um and I had a doctor at the time that had didn't take any scopes hadn't seen really much of what was going on but told me that if I had uh, cuz I, I had learned that IV steroids gets things out of under control and or weaning on and off of just the uh, prednisone mm. um so I'd asked him if I could do that and then and by no means do I want to take any medications. Uh, he kind of treated me like I was crazy and said if I had asked again that he would give me an ileostomy bag again. And I was just like, you haven't even done a scope. I mean, maybe once I'm really, really old, but last they've looked, it looks amazing. I'm not doing that. So I ditched all my medications. Um, and now it's been about four or five years that I haven't been hospitalized. Because I used to get hospitalized at least once every year. Um, I'm off of all medications. Uh, I think we can talk about cannabis, but huge shout out to medicinal cannabis. It's been a life save. <laughs> I'm like going way off routes if I here. Could just jump in one second yeah. because it <laughs> International Women's Day and all that, mm -hmm. and and I don't want anyone to think that this whole interview is based on what I'm about to say. It's, it's kind of a chicken and egg kind of thing because we've been talking yeah, about so scheduling this interview for a few weeks. Yeah. Um, so oh, wow. Mariah calls me about uh, uh, 10 days ago and says, um, I'm suddenly part of a Levi's campaign, it's international been, uh, global campaign. They picked me and three other women from around the world and I'm now representing Levi's. So, I, I mean, I can't even wrap my head and around I wasn't it, but it has nothing. nothing to do with, but maybe it has to do with this oneness of things that are all going on. But I don't want you to, the listening audience, to think we're here, that Tim brought her here because, oh, she's now this celebrity at no, Levi's everywhere. No, not a celebrity. It's uh, because we, uh, you made this it's movie. Funny. She made the movie. But it is an interesting thing how these things sort of all go together. Tell us a little, little, little bit it about that. It did fall in well. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That's still – everything in my life is mind-blowing to me. I'm just kind of taking it in. I'm very grateful and thankful and privileged. And um, it's not just me, though. I mean, my story is me and my accomplishments are me. And I know that – I, <laughs> that I am part, but seriously, every single thing in my life, every single bit of accomplishment or that of things that I'm involved with has so many other people involved in them. That is a, a blessing and a privilege, but all of Girl Swirl, all of the community, all of the world, Neil, everybody just is such a huge part of that. And so, yeah, it's exciting. That's wonderful. I tell you what, here at the uh, at the uh, Synagogue's uh, DVD movie podcast, we like watching things happen incipiently, the beginning of a thing. Yeah. Uh, mostly because, you know, 10 years from now, I can call you back and say, hey, you remember when you were on my show? <laughs> you know, when you were <laughs> yeah. a big old movie star? And frankly, I'm hoping you're going to give me a job sometime. Mm -hmm. You know, in a couple of years, your oh hire gosh. brother. Oh my gosh, right now. A higher brother. That would be an honor. You guys, because you're doing, some, you're doing fantastic work. It's a beautiful film. Where can people see your film, generally speaking? Does it live any place online, Vimeo here, there, wherever? Mm -hmm. uh, where can people see your movie? It is on Vimeo at the moment, but it's private because we have been submitting to some film festivals. Mm -hmm. um, where we see this going is more underground style and just super um, in with other creatives that are kind of in our same world of things so like i have a i want to screen it on the side of a in the the skate bowl and ah. at night time and do like little because it's only about 13 minutes long mm -hmm. so it'd be fun to do a sit down have a screening of it and then get it out there to the world probably through the vimeo link and who knows what else is to come from that i'm not gonna put a box on it but for sure there's gonna be some pop-up fun little in and out premiering i'll look forward to it let us know and we'll, and we'll let the folks out there know neil yes Mar thank you both Pleasure thank you so out. much Pleasure to talk to you deeply deeply appreciate it you, you, you're just the greatest this and everything else <laughs> i'm gonna go ahead and accept that compliment for those of you out there um uh, take a cue from the young lady here if you want to do it just do it <laughs> so since we last spoke mariah uh the world has suffered a um 
a pandemic, uh, and your film got into a film festival. So let's talk about the f- pandemic first, and then the film festival that your movie's going to be in. How are you? How are you oh faring through all of this? Have you been able to work? Well, no, and yes. I mean, as an artist, you kind of work. And first of all, I'd like to say what a juxtapose of words to be able to say during a pandemic and your film get in released that was weird to hear next to each other uh, so yeah definitely doing fortunate happy to be able to say that Outstanding. Uh, that's really well. That's really good. That's really, really good. I'm glad to hear that. All right, now let's talk about this film festival um, it's, uh, that, your, that your film got into and how people are going to be able to see it in an odd sort of way. In an odd sort of way, film festivals uh, are, have been going sort of virtual uh, because obviously the pandemic. And because film festivals uh-huh. are going virtual, it really means that more people. Uh, might have the opportunity to see and experience a film than would have otherwise. Um, uh, because, you know, hey, look, if you weren't, if you didn't happen to be in California at a certain time for a certain film festival, well, then you couldn't see the movie. But now pretty much anybody in the world can see the movie. Tell us about the film festival, the name of it, and, and, uh, and when it will be actually virtually, a, uh, people can go and, and visit the film festival. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was actually reflecting on that, and... I can imagine, you know, some people, they dream their whole life to be able to go to the festival, you know, and network and meet and see these people in person and just have the whole experience, you know, so at the very beginning of everything, it was like, like, a, oh, man, you know, like, oh, what now? But I feel like, and I hope for others, they feel the same, but for me, as time go- has gone on with it, I have gotten to see that light of it, that it is on much a much bigger platform than it could have been, you know, or would have been, we would have had to, you know, get to be expressive and excited and share with everybody that it's going to be in the film festival, but only the people that went to the festival would have been able to experience it, you know, and so now, yeah, it's on a much broader platform, and at first, you know, Neil and I had discussed, like, oh, should we just go ahead and release the film and let people see it and I was like no you know I people are going through things at the moment I don't want to just be putting stuff out there you mm-hmm. know and I had just had this feeling personally like uh, okay I'm ready to share it with everyone you know I think that it's time enough to where it might actually be helpful for some people you know to hear that others do have struggles and sorry <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm always so emotional um that others do have struggles and you're not alone so I think that it was really divine timing and <laughs> I don't want to cry. Um, and that I'm excited that it's being able to see be seen by such a broad audience just in the mere fact of I hope its message can help others right now. That's fantastic. Uh, the Fine Arts Film Festival, F-A-F-F, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, the Fine Arts Film Festival of Venice, California. So cool. Uh-huh. Um, when are the, when are, when are the actual have, dates of the actual festival, uh, when, when, when things mm-hmm. will be available? When will that be? Well, so right now it's on pre-order. They're doing it by series. Mm. Um, so you can either pre-order by the series or you can get the whole series. But then the actual dates of the festival are June 8th, which is a Monday through June 14th, which is a Sunday. And um, during that time period, whether you pre-order or not, you can just go on and pick and choose what you what you watch. But I think there's 93 films from all over the globe, and it's dolly inspired, and it's just super fun. There's a lot of other really creative artists that are involved, and I'm super excited to be able to watch all the other films and be included with the lineup. But yeah, June 8th through June 14th. It's a really um, good film festival, website, uh, the but, Fine Arts mm-hmm. Film Festival. Um, uh, what's what's the website again? Say say it for me. What's that you said? What what's the, what's the website? Oh yes. Um. So you type in Fine Arts Film Festival. Um. I can pull up the exact website. Yeah, that'd be great. You know how we're we're competed by now with Google and such. Just type it <laughs> in, it pulls up. You don't even look at the thing anymore. Um, okay, so it's www.thefineartsfilmfestival.com. Fantastic. Perfect. Fantastic. And from uh, there, the, the people will be able to navigate their way to the, to the films. People will be able to navigate their way to the various different movies from there. Oh, yeah. It's right on the front page, and it lists at the top um, 
different like ways to get involved with them in the future as well. If you have a film that you want to submit, they uh, show all their judges and panelists and all their sponsors on there. And yeah, it's all laid out really nicely on there. And they also have an Instagram where they've been highlighting everybody's story daily and sharing updates on there. And that's just as well um, the Fine Arts Film Festival. Fantastic. Uh, tell everybody the name of your film again. And um, I, I can't and I, and I can't wait for folks all over the world now to be able to see it. Crazy. Huh? I know. OK, so it is uncomfortably comfortable. The diary of being uncomfortably comfortable. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, Mariah, thanks for letting me touch, uh, get back in touch with you and update everybody about this. It, 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 it's kind of fortuitous. Well. It's fantastic. Kind of fortuitous. Thank you so much. Just honestly, thank you. Well, stay well, and we will all be looking for your film, Uncomfortably Comfortable.